What is the abbreviation of CY? Uh, cover your posterior. CYP? <laughs> CYBS? Cover your backside? I don't know. However you want to put it. All right. Um, All right. Any other questions? You get the assignment. We're good. Yeah. I. So, with if we're doing the uniform cost search, what is a uh, movement cost for a tab? Is it the get travel speed from the model, or so? Yeah. How, get, how are you to access that? Get travel speed will tell you how many pixels will be added to your. So you have a direction and a speed. And you'll move in that direction the amount of magnitude distance that the speed returns to you. So I imagine that's what you would use as cost. Although speed and cost are kind of inversely proportional, right? So because speed is more speed is good, I guess you take the reciprocal of speed and call that cost or something like that. Although it depends what you consider cost. The cost of going slow might be a lot higher than a little bit slow because it means you're more likely to get killed, right? So you might find that it's actually beneficial to severely penalize that uh, low cost. So maybe the reciprocal of the square root of cost for our speed or the reciprocal of speed squared. I can't remember which one would be. I don't know. Um, the gist of it is that's one of those parameters that you might want to use a genetic algorithm to tune is how do you penalize cost because, or how do you penalize speed, excuse me, because maybe different penalties will result in more effective agents. Um, it, because there's not a clear mapping between speed and cost, it's kind of one of those heuristic hand wavy type things. I know that's more of an answer than you wanted, but I wanted to talk about it, so I'm going off about it. Okay. Um, so we have recently talked a little bit about artificial neural networks because you used them in the genetic algorithm assignment. Do you remember that? Let me remind you of artificial neural networks. We draw them like this. We connect them with lines like this. And data goes in, and data comes out, and they're kind of these black box things that compute some mysterious function, and that can be useful for when you need to approximate some mysterious function. Okay. What I want to show you today is a proof that neural networks are universal function approximators. So first, let me motivate what that means. Um, Suppose that you have some really hard function, like, what would be a really hard function to model? Maybe like this, go like that, and then like this, and then drop down here, and then have a discontinuity. Oops, now it's not a function. And then go like that. Then go over here. That's a pretty crazy function, right? Um, one might say, can a neural network do that function? And if neural networks are universal function approximators, then the answer is yes. A universal function approximator can approximate any function. Um, now, let's try to extend this. Let's suppose that they are universal function approximators, meaning a neural network can do any function. What about the human brain? Is that a function? Uh, depends how we represent it. Kind of yeah, kind of no. Suppose we say that a lifetime of experiences go in, and also the current situation. And here's a black box. Now, I don't know how you're possibly going to encode that in a vector of numbers, but let's just say that somehow you did. 
And what comes out is your choices that you're going to make. Does this sufficiently represent a human brain? I think you'll agree with me the answer is no. Your brain does a lot more than just figure out what to do. But nevertheless, it would be really interesting if we had a proof that a neural network was capable of doing that. Because that's a darn hard problem, right? That's a, that would be amazing if we could prove that, wouldn't it? Kind of. Well, is that a function? Or is it not a function? Well, you have an input and an output, so. You have inputs, you have outputs, yeah. Are the outputs determined by the inputs, or are the outputs determined by other things? But we know the answer to that, and this one's for the philosophers. So I cannot say that I know for sure the things you do depend only on your lifetime of experiences and your situation. I guess we should add genetics in there, too. Because if you're a sea sponge, then uh, you're probably not going to decide to show up to artificial intelligence class, as there are no sea sponges in here. Um, is there anything else that affects your choices that we know of, that we know affects your choices? I don't know, maybe physical limitations? Um, but I claim this is a function, at least, and it's a darn interesting function, and I'd like to know if a neural network can do this function. And so I'm going to claim if it can do this function, just because this one is arbitrarily crazy. This one's not really, this one doesn't have lots of dimensional input and it only has one dimensional output. So this isn't the same thing as making life choices, but it is a crazy function. So if it can model this one, does that mean it can model this one? What do you think? <clears throat> It, it's kind of a weird philosophical thing, I agree, and so nobody wants to take a stand. But I'll claim that it at least makes sense. This is a function. It takes about a billion inputs and produces however many inputs run down your spinal cord to control your whole body and make the muscles contract and make air come out my mouth and move my tongue and all the things I'm doing. Um, but even though it's a lot of data mapping to quite a lot of data, it's still a function. It's just vector in, vector out, right? Can you encode the state of a lifetime of experiences in a vector? If you have a large enough vector. <laughs> if you have a large enough vector, that's going to be one darn large vector, but... <laughs> Our brains manage it. Yeah, let's, let's just go into theory land. Okay. In theory, can you encode a lifetime of experiences in a vector? Yes. Well, you can certainly encode images in a vector because that's what a PNG file is, right? Uh, you can certainly encode sound in it, which means you can encode things you can see and things you can hear. Why not tactile information? And I can imagine feelings of touch all over my body. That could probably be encoded as a vector. Well, now just throw all, concatenate all these vectors into a lifetime of it. Pretty much, I'm going to say, yeah. I mean, it's not practical. It wouldn't fit on any hard drive, but. At least theoretically, yeah. Can genetics be encoded in a vector? Well, DNA does it, so yes. Although, arguably, your whole biome it matters too, so it's not just DNA. You have to encode all the bacteria, but presumably that can be done too. Um, I mean, we've, we've simulated a C. elegans worm, right? Remember that, the open worm thing? So why, why not a bacterial cell that's much simpler than a, a nematode roundworm? And somehow the state of the world. Can you encode the state of the world in a vector? Well, in theory, yeah. In practice, obviously not. OK. I'm going to claim that this is a function. And so let's answer the question, are neural networks universal function approximators? So I have a question. Yes. If you try to encode the state of, like say you're trying to encode the state of the world, and whatever you're, wherever you're trying to encode it is in the world, doesn't that make an uh -huh. encryption problem? I think Girdle would really like that question. <laughs> um, that's the kind of thing he does to defeat all kinds of proofs. <laughs> and I guess you're right. If that encoding is in the world, then we've got a bit of a problem, unless 
you can reference yourself. The great thing about information is you can do things that aren't physically possible. For example, I can talk about flying, but I can't fly. There's the whole question, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? Well, the question turns back on itself, and yet the real world doesn't deal with that question, right. as far as I know. Um, so, I, um, I don't know, information can do things that the physical world can't, so I don't see why you can't encode yourself in there as long as you can reference yourself. Maybe, I don't know, but thanks, weird philosophical question. Yeah. I think I'm gonna argue encoding the state of the world would be impossible because you have to know like the position of like every atom in the universe and such, you know, like right. the gravitational pull of everything, just so you know like how everything is affecting this one thing here. And wouldn't True. you need like the entire universe to store this information? Yeah, that's kind of the same argument. And the, and here's the strange counter argument is the universe does it because the universe does encode itself, because the universe is itself, right? I, I mean, every particle in the universe could be said to be an encoding of that particle of the universe. Uh, okay, now we're getting to the point where it's weird and, and who cares. Let's suppose that you got it almost right, <laughs> that you almost encoded a lifetime of experience and almost end all of your genetics in your situation. You could still probably get darn close to the choices you make. And that's probably good enough for AI, because we're not trying to produce real AI, just artificial intelligence. So I'm still going to claim universal function approximators have a, a theoretical reason for existence. OK. Here's a Wikipedia article on it. It says, in the mathematical theory of artificial neural networks, the universal approximation theorem states that a feed-forward network with a single hidden layer I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Containing a finite number of neurons. So notice it says finite, not infinite. Can approximate continuous functions on compact subsets of r to the n. Do you know what r to the n means? 